Live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the, the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to talk about the episode, The Deadly Years. Um, in this episode, a number of crew people, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, uh, Scotty, Chekhov, and Ensign Galloway go down to a science outpost that they are supposed to be doing a yearly check on. Uh, they find that nobody's there. Then Chekhov goes into one of the buildings and he's like, ah, holy fuck, it's a, it's a dead body. I'm really scared for some reason, even though I am a military officer. I am freaking out about this dead body. Um, it's a super, super old dude. McCoy goes in. He's like, oh, yeah, this person has died of extreme old age. And Scott and Spock is like, but they couldn't have because nobody in this scientific expedition was over 30. Which, incidentally, does not ring all that true, right? Like, if you have sent out a scientific expedition... So, I... I'm in my mid-30s at time of filming, right? It's very, very hard to be accomplished enough that you would be, like, everybody in this expedition is under 30. Like, to get a doctorate, and many scientists probably would have doctorates, to get a doctorate, like, you would be at, at the earliest in your late 20s. Um, similarly, Kirk in this episode establishes that he's supposed to be 34 years old. That to me seems extraordinarily young to be in command of one of a dozen of the most advanced vessels in the entire entirety of Starfleet, right? Like, that's normally something that you get decades of experience before you make it to that sort of top-tier command, I would think. I don't know that. I've never been in the military. Maybe it's easier to become a, a top person at a young age than I think it is. But to me, it seems extraordinarily unlikely that somebody as young as Kirk would be in that position of responsibility. I'm going to set that aside. Uh, so, they go and they find this dead body, a person who's died of extreme old age, um, two more people then sort of show up. They're super, super old. Uh, turns out that they are 29 and 27, but they look super, super old. And then they die shortly. Uh, they die of old age shortly after being brought back to the ship. Then the members of the, the shore party, with the exception of Chekhov, start aging rapidly. Spock says at one point that they're aging about 30 years per day. And he figures that they have 
sorry, that they have a week to live, which means Spock figures they're each going to live to at least 210 years old, which is mathematically wrong, I think, but eh, we're not going to look too deep into that. So basically, uh, the members of the, the chore party, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Scotty, and um, Anson Galloway, are aging at different rates. Um, they're having different issues. Um, Kirk's memory starts going. He starts repeating orders. Um, he forgets he's signed important documents, etc., etc. Um, Spock's thinking process slows down. He starts feeling extremely cold. Like at one point, he says he's turned the temperature in his personal quarters up to 125 degrees, which is tolerable. Uh, Scotty gets really, really gray. Um, McCoy gets increasingly gray. Everybody is just sort of deteriorating. Um, Ensign Galway is the only one who dies. She dies because she's never in any other episode and we don't really care about her. Um, but basically they can't figure out what's going on. They can't, they can't determine why this thing is happening. Um, and finally they sort of figure out, okay, there was this crazy comet that had like a radioactive trail. The, planet that they, the scientific expedition had been on passed through the tail of that comet, and that somehow gave them a form of radiation sickness that sped up the natural aging process. But they don't know what to do about it until they work out that the, the reason that Chekhov was not affected was because when he was um, infected with this radiation sickness, he had that fright from seeing the dead body. And so he was, uh, his system was flooded with adrenaline. And so I guess back in the year, the early years after the development of uh, nuclear weapons, one of the things that they tried to treat radiation sickness with was adrenaline. By the time of the Star Trek universe that we know in this, in the original series, uh, that has been superseded by a different drug. But they go back to adrenaline, and basically they work out a compound of adrenaline that they can inject into the infected crew members, um, and it reverses the process of aging. While all that stuff is going on, um, you also have a Commodore on board, who apparently has never had a field command, which again seems very, very strange to me. The idea that you could become a Commodore in Starfleet without ever having been in command of a spaceship of any kind seems really bizarre. Like, it seems like that would be a basic thing that everybody would have to do to make it to a top rank, but apparently not. Um, but this guy is going to be in charge of Starbase 10. He really wants to get to Starbase 10. And Kirk is reluctant to do that because um, he's concerned that if they're going to solve this problem, it may actually require going back down to the planet, getting more information, whatever it is. Finally, Kirk gets taken out of command because his mental faculties are declining. This Commodore takes over and he's like, Let's go to Starbase 10. We'll just go through the Romulan neutral zone. Which the Romulans, incidentally, are not keen on. Um, they surround the Enterprise. They start shooting at it. The Commodore is like, oh, oh no, I don't know what to do. Call the Romulans. And the Romulans are like, yeah, we're not picking up the phone because we're going to blast you. And then the Commodore's like, well, I guess we need to surrender. And Jackoff's like, yeah, but the Romulans don't take captives, so we can't really do that. And then Kirk shows back up in the nick of time, pulls this trick where he sends a message on a, on a channel he knows that the Romulans have broken. Um, we get a good throwback to the Corbomite device from a, an earlier episode called the Corbomite Maneuver. It's this fake uh, self-destruct mechanism that Kirk made up to try and bluff a different alien species into not attacking them. So we get all that. The big thing uh, in terms of social justice elements, obviously, is the depiction and treatment of aging. Um, 
Treat treatment not in the medical sense necessarily, but treatment in the sense of like how this is presented, right? So I know a number of people who are in their 60s, early 70s. Um, what the computer says physiologically is that Kirk is in his 60s to he's between 60 and 72 physiologically. Kirk is much more decrepit as a 60 to 72 year old man than most 60 to 70 year olds that I know personally. Uh, his memory is very, very bad. Like he can't even remember thing. I mean, and I guess this might be like early onset, I guess early onset, maybe. I mean, he is 34, but he's physiologically 60 to 72. Um, this could be some form of, like, dementia or um, Alzheimer's, something like this. But, like, in the competency hearing where they try and determine whether or not he is competent to remain in command, like, he keeps forgetting what the name of the planet is. He keeps giving the wrong name of the planet. It's like Gamma, I think it's Gamma Hydra 4 that they are orbiting. And he keeps saying Gamma Hydra 2, even though people keep correcting him. And then, like, a minute later, he'll go back and say Gamma Hydra 2. And he's trying to use that as evidence that his memory is as sharp as it's ever been. So, I mean, we've got the, yeah, just these very stereotypical, over the top, rather insulting <laughs> depictions of aging. And this, and okay, so the caveat here is that these are people who are primarily in their 30s and 40s. To suddenly be thrust into your seven, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever it is, yeah, that's going to be disconcerting. But the ways in which aging is presented here is as this sort of terrifying fate, this horrible experience of loss of physical ability, loss of mental ability, um, just difficulty coping with things that are fairly simple and straightforward, um, all of these things. And again, I get that this is a form of radiation sickness. This is a, a degeneration based on... Um, an abnormal behavior of physiology and psychology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the ways in which it's presented, the the physiological symptoms, the psychological symptoms, are very much over the top in ways that that are quite problematic um, in terms of ageism, anti. Uh, the sort of anti-elderly um, stereotypes and things like this. 